Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium as we continue our journey to build transformers from scratch. Now in the last few videos we've taken a look at different components of building out the encoder of the transformer neural network and in the last video specifically we also took a look at the architecture that was involved in building this network. So in this video we're going to look at the code which is used to build the encoder. And if you look here, the code is only 100 lines long. So I'm gonna be explaining as much of this code as I possibly can, and we'll also try to make it catered for people who are just starting out with Python, PyTorch, and also just the concept of deep learning too. So let's get to it. To help me kind of explain all of this, alongside the code, I also have a runnable Google Colab notebook, which I've executed and have run on just some sample input just to get an idea of which layers are run and how large the shapes are for every tensor as they pass through them. But don't worry, I'll probably be explaining these bit by bit. So in order to get started, Let's just start with some basic parameters that we're seeing here. D model is going to be the size of every single vector throughout the encoder architecture. And what I mean by that is we have, for example, in this transform architecture, we have my name is a J. Let's say that we want to translate from English to some language French. We'll be passing all of these simultaneously through the transformer encoder. And eventually we're going to get different vectors here for every single word. More technically, this would be a word piece, or it could be characters, but I'm just saying words as just an example here. Now, the size or the number of numbers for every single one of these vectors is going to be 512. And not only that, but if we kind of blow up this architecture, we're going to see that, let's say we have my name is a J, each of these is represented by vectors, which will inevitably become 512 dimensions. And we also kind of see this throughout, that all of these vectors, you'll see, whatever we do, we'll add eventually something called positional encodings. It'll also be 512 dimensions. And this is going to be like three times 512. So everything, every vector that you'll see kind of throughout the encoder architecture will be somewhat related to 512 dimensions. And this is the reason why I've just defined it as a parameter here. The next is the number of heads. So the number of heads specifically is used in the concept of multi-headed attention. Now in the transformer neural network architecture, we see these multi-headed attention units. Well, essentially when we're performing the concept of attention, we are actually going to perform it eight times in parallel. And this can be represented in this figure over here, where you're, you'll see that we have, we'll construct like, let's say, uh, query vectors, key vectors, and value vectors over here, and we'll get all of these vectors. And then eventually we will perform, there's going to be eight operations that we perform simultaneously, where we take the softmax and perform all of that good stuff with respect to attention. So essentially you can see, consider this as the number of parallelized operations that we perform within the encoder. Next is drop prob. Now throughout this encoder, we're going to be performing something called a dropout, where we're going to randomly turn off certain neurons. And what this allows the neural network to do is it forces it to learn along different paths over here and thus make weight updates accordingly. This will help the neural network be better able to generalize data instead of accidentally memorizing specific data. And effectively, this acts as a regularizer, if you've heard the concept of regularization, for neural networks. And it's pretty useful when it comes to very deep networks with a lot of connections and parameters. Now I've set this probability to 0.1, which basically means that there is a 10% chance that a given neuron will be turned off on a given stage. We can adjust this value to be anywhere between zero and one. 
Now we have batch size, which I've just set to as 30. So when we're dealing with neural networks and we want to perform some training, typically we would pass in multiple examples at the same time. Those multiple examples constitute a batch. And there's actually a couple of reasons why I would do this. So first of all, it's faster training. And second, it's also more stable training. Now let's take a look at this diagram over here where this is the contours of a loss function that we see as the incentric circles. And we want to get down to the red point. So you can imagine these outer contours are higher. And we want to kind of get to the lower point. Now, if we had performed, you know, looked at one example at a time, pass it through the network, perform back propagation, let the weights update, then that would just be one update. And we would need to do this for every single example. And that's where you get this purple curve, which is stochastic gradient descent, where some examples may be good, and so they'll lead you to the loss, but then the next example may be bad and lead you away from the loss, and it becomes this very noisy gradient update. And we need a lot of them in order to converge to the eventual red point. Now, on the other hand, if we had taken batches of data, like if we had basically batched our entire, all of our data together, put it through the network and be like, first look at all of these examples, and then you perform your back propagation, then we would have led to this blue curve right here. Now that could be a lot of data to process at once. So typically a good middle ground for many of these machine learning and deep learning problems is to use mini batches. So do somewhere along the middle where we will batch some, some arbitrary number of examples together in order to just learn effectively, quickly, and also in a way that's more stable. So that you every time that you know you'll see examples, you will see that the loss on average will always decrease. And so in this case, for now, going back to our screen, we're going to be, it's saying that we are going to look at 30 examples of let's say 30 sentences in some English language. And it's only then that it's going to propagate through the entire network, that is go through the encoder and the decoder. Then we have a loss function, which is going to be computed. And then the gradients are going to be calculated in the reverse direction and we'll have gradient updates. All the parameters will be updated only after seeing 30 examples. And so we have like a mini batch gradient descent that we're gonna be performing. Next is max sequence length, which is, this is the largest number of words. In our case, words, let's just say that we're translating from English to French. So it's the largest number of words that we can be passing in at a time through the encoder. Now, in reality, this is always going to be the number of words that we pass in through the encoder. Because if we actually look at the blown up architecture, if I just go all the way to the beginning over here, you'll notice that if we pass in my name is a J as the input English sentence to the transformer encoder, we're going to be also passing a lot of padding tokens here. And this padding token will be, let's say, you know, if there's the maximum sequence length is like 200 words and the sentence is only four words and there'll be 196 padding tokens here that are just going to be passed in. And this is always going to be the case where we'll have a sentence and then we will add some padding tokens such that the maximum sequence length is achieved. So there's always a fixed length input for any kind of sentence that we decide to input to our transformer encoder. The next is FFN hidden. Now, when we actually look at the architecture here, we have like a feed forward network. While most of the cases, like throughout the entire encoder, and even like through almost all the entire decoder, we will have 512 dimensional vectors, like I mentioned before. It's only at this step over here that I'm going to be expanding the number of neurons at some point to be 2048 before making it eventually back down to 512. And this is simply to just learn additional information if and while we can, like any other feed forward layer is designed to do. Now, num layers over here is the number of transformer encoder units that we want to include in our architecture. And if you look here at our diagram, 
you'll see that there's this n times whatever this is. So this is the n is the number of transformer layers because these are typically repeated. So we have inputs going in, we'll have it pass through the encoder layer, and then we'll have it pass through another encoder layer, and then another encoder layer, and then another, maybe as many times as you want to, and then it's passed into the decoder, which is also repeated in this case, n times. So we will repeat it again, like if in this case it's five times, we'll repeat the decoder five times before eventually coming out with an output. And so in our case, I've defined n, the number of layers, as five. And this can vary depending on complexity. So you can change this to a higher number if you have a lot more data, and also it can pick up more complex patterns. Otherwise, you can also keep it pretty low. Now we'll take all of these values and we're gonna create an encoder object by passing it into the class defined as encoder, which I'll scroll up to, and passing all of these values. So let me just take a look now at that same code over here, because I think it's just easier and cleaner. So we have this class called encoder. And in this case, we have a, this is the constructor, and this is a forward method. Now, every class that we consider here as a part of a network typically will derive its subclass from module. So module is like the superclass, the class in which it inherits from. Now, the reason why we will inherit from this module class is that it allows us to perform many operations behind the scene that are required for learning. So for example, for one, it actually provides its own forward method. And it also helps us, you know, take our tensors, for example, and it will, we can add it to, for example, CPU and CUDA, where we can do like CPU, where we might need to take our tensors, put it on CPU if we're doing inference, or we, we need to put it on CUDA for, if we wanted to do some model training. And it also helps us access like parameters a lot better where we can take, for example, let's say, let me go here and see, we can get our parameters and also even modify them for initialization purposes. So module basically provides a lot of that bootstrap code for us that we don't really need to worry about. It also helps us, you know, if we want to save checkpoints, it's easy to do so using these modules where we've trained, let's say for like 100 iterations, we want to save the model. Modules, defining modules or extending classes from modules makes it very easy to save the state. And for those reasons, we would want to use modules. And so we extend modules here. And because we extend modules, we want to override the forward method. Now. In our constructor though, right here, I've defined this sequential here. So this sequential unit is essentially going to take all the comma separated values here, and it's going to execute them in the forward pass one at a time, one after the other. Now, the way I've defined this is, well, for the encoder, the encoder contains multiple encoder layers. In this case, it contains like five encoder layers because here num layers is going to be five. And so I will call encoder layers, which I will explain very soon. And I'm going to execute this five times. And here you'll see I'll have a star in front of a Python list, which will basically take the list and it will deconstruct it into its component five elements. And then we're passing it into sequential. So now we have a sequence of five encoder layer objects. Now we are overriding the forward method. And when we override a module's forward method, what happens is that it'll take an input and it will propagate that input for the forward propagation step, where we will pass it into our layers, which we've defined here. So essentially it's passing it through all of the five encoder layers. And then we'll have an output over here, which I've just overridden as X, and we are returning that value. And so that will be the overall output of the entire transformer encoder. And so I hope now you understand like what's going on now at a high level. We can now dig deeper and deeper and go with the lower level layers. So for example, what is this transformer encoder layer that we see here? So to see that, we'll scroll up. Now in our encoder layer, we have a constructor again and a forward method, which we use for the forward pass. Now in the constructor, 
We'll first start every constructor out by calling the super classes constructor so that it defines everything in the module. So all the module components are now set up. Now multi-head attention is going to be performing the multi-head self attention of the encoder. We then have layer normalization, which I will explain shortly. We have dropout, and then we'll have the feed forward layer, and then one more layer normalization, which I am explain, you know, which I have defined individually, and then another dropout. I've arranged this forward pass, and I've arranged all of them in a way that it's kind of very similar to looking at this diagram. So you can just see this rectangle is the encoder layer where if this is X, this input is X, you see that first we will take a residual value. We'll just save it because we need it later. We'll then pass it into the multi-head attention followed by add a normalization. So we'll take the residual X, then we will then pass it into the multi-head attention. In this case, I'm passing a value called mask to the attention layer and set it as none. This is because like the process of attention requires paying uh, in self-attention specifically, like let's say that you have all the words in the English sentence, it's going to pay to all pay attention to all of the other words. Since all of these words in the encoder are passed in simultaneously, we don't need to pass in any masking. There's no need to say, oh, we can't look at some words in the future because we kind of already have all the words of our English sentence if we wanted to translate it to some other language. And so... I'll explain this in a bit, but for now, the mask actually is just set to none because we don't really need a mask here, it's optional. And then we'll perform dropout, which is randomly turning off the neurons. We will then add the residual connection to this current value, and then we'll perform layer normalization. So this is the equivalent of add and norm that we see over here. We'll then take this output, whatever this is, x again. We'll pass it through a feed forward and do some add and normalization. So let's take the residual, pass it through a feed forward, do some dropout, just to randomly turn off the neurons. And then we perform add and norm. And eventually, we'll now get the output of our encoder layer. And so I hope that looking at just this is a good representation of what this image here looks like. Now that we have a little bit of a higher intuition of like the encoder layer, let's actually pick these individual units apart and see what they're really doing. And let's start with the biggest multi-head attention class over here. Now in order to understand multi-head attention, I think it's actually best to start with the scale dot product operation, which is like the single head attention or the core or crux of the attention mechanism. So let's get started with this. Now, if you look at the original paper here, and I'm gonna scroll down to this section, you can see that the core attention matrix can be represented mathematically as a soft max of, let's say this Q vector, which is a query vector times the key vector. We'll scale it and then we'll perform a soft max and multiply it by a value vector. So this attention matrix, essentially when we talk about query key and value, essentially every single word is going to be broken down into three vectors. That is a query vector, a key vector, and a value vector. Now the query vector is what am I looking for? The key vector is what do I have to offer? And then the value vector can be considered as what I actually offer on attention. So I think the distinction between the key and the value, it seems a little fuzzy, but I think if we look at the code, it's going to be a lot more clear. Now, this here is the attention function where it takes in a query key and value and an optional mask, like I mentioned before. Now, in this case, our query vector for one attention head is going to be 64 dimensions. And so this will be like 64. I'm gonna write this out entirely when we're just doing a pass for um, just looking at the layer sizes themselves. But for now, just say that this is just a constant and this DK is like some value called 64. We then now perform the matrix multiplication 
of the query and the key. Now, this key vector is actually not just for one word, but it's for all words for this one head. So this might be a, a tensor instead. So this is going to be like, it's gonna have like a batch followed by sequence length and then some encoding value. And we need to here only perform the transpose by only flipping the last two dimensions. To understand this operation, let's say that we have like some tensor that's 30 cross 200 cross 512. Now, in our case, this is the batch dimension, cross the maximum sequence length, cross for every single word, what is the embedding dimension length. Now, if we just do a transpose of this, we'll notice that all of these values are just inverted. All of these shapes are completely inverted. But if we use a transpose negative one comma negative two, it's only going to take the last two dimensions over here and flip them. And that's why we have a 30 cross 512 cross 200 instead of a 30 cross 200 cross 512. And so that is exactly what's happening to the key vector over here. And now we multiply both of these in order to get the attention matrix. So essentially for your reference right now, this is going to be a max sequence length cross max sequence length tensor along with an additional batch dimension. And we are scaling this value with respect to a constant, which is the square root of dk. Now, the reason why we're doing this, we can kind of see in this collab notebook. So let's just say we have a query, a key vector, and then the query times the key vector. And for each, we're going to determine the variance of the examples that are within them. So in the query vector, it's like 0.68. It's kind of close to 1, kind of close to 1. This one's well above 1, though, the query times key that variance is pretty large. But, and also the mean is closer to zero for all of them. Well, you know, just keep, them, keep in mind this is negative 0.04. Now, if you scale these values though, you'll notice that, well, the query and key, nothing changes, but, the val but this query times key now also becomes, has a variance of the order of one. And its mean also actually has a variance that's slightly, it's a four times smaller than this. It's closer to zero. And so what scaling allows us to do over here is to ensure that the variance of values within these matrices have kind of like a mean zero standard deviation of one. And this allows us for easier and stable training. Now, what I mean by this is, let's say that we perform back propagation, right? So we did a forward propagation, we have some values, we now do some back propagation. And there are going to be, if there are extremely large values here, that can affect the size of our gradient step. And so what we want to do is make sure that these values are as nominal and normalized as possible so that we have stable steps that we take during training. And we won't have like obscenely large or obscenely small values that are propagated throughout the network that affect these gradients negatively. And so it's just stable learning. Next, we have an optional mask, which we pass through a scale tensor. Note that when we're passing a mask, we don't need it for the encoder. But in the case of a decoder, there are situations where, you know, we have an input where we pass in simultaneously, but technically we don't know what's going to be the output for the next word because we're generating them one at a time. And in order to deal with this, what we'll do is we'll create a mask that kind of looks like this, where we'll have a mass that has like, it'll have like, let's say this is for the output of a French sentence where let's say that it only has four words. So this would be, you know, some output French sentence here. And this would be four words of the output French sentence of self-attention. Now in this case though, in, in training, we have access to all of the data so we can see everything, but we shouldn't be using all of that data during training because that's considered cheating. Because during inference time, we don't know what the next word is going to be generated. When I'm generating the first word, I only know about it. When I'm generating the second word, I only know about them. And that's why you can see that when I know the first word, I can only per perform this like attention for that first word. For the second word, I can perform for the first, I can pay attention to the first two words. And then I can pay attention to the first three words for the third word and pay attention to the first four words for the fourth word. And so this is going to be more relevant when I talk about the decoder in a separate video. But for this video, you don't need to worry about this mask at all.
It's also considered an optional mask if we wanted to pass it through the encoder. Next is that we are going to then perform attention. So when I say attention here is that we'll take all of the values of this scaled and then we are going to perform a softmax so that we get probability values of how much should we focus. And the way that looks here is that we'll have initially this, let's say this matrix right here, this is the scaled matrix of with applied mask in this case. But if we apply the softmax operation, you'll see that all of the rows will add up to one. And so this is basically saying the first word should focus 100% on this word. The second word should focus 51% on the first and 48% on the second and so on for the third word and the fourth word. So now these are like interpretable probabilities of how much we should be focusing on. And then we're going to multiply all of these attention values, which are now like probabilities with the value matrices. So this is now going to give you a new set of tensors for every single word. Now what these new values do is for every input word, we'll now have a new value vector and that value vector will actually have all the information associated with context. It will know how much attention it needs to pay to all of the other words in that sentence. And so you can consider this value vector for the words to just have more context awareness and hence be of higher quality than just the inputs. Now this here is the code for one attention head, but when we're actually executing the forward pass for multi-head attention, you can see that that only happens at like one stage here. And we kind of have to prepare um, the entire input in order to split it up into these multi-heads. So what are we doing and how are we doing that? So I'm just gonna put some numbers here because I think it's gonna be useful where we have this D model is going to be 512 dimensions. The number of heads, this is going to be eight. Now the heading dimension here is going to be 512 divided by eight, which is 64. Then we'll have the KQV layer, which is going to be a linear layer of D model cross three times D model. The linear layer is basically like a feed forward layer that is used for prop forward propagation. And in this case, typically in, in theory, let's go back to our encoder architecture over here. In theory, we would have like all of the, the input vectors and we will split them up individually. Each 512 dimension vector, we would split it up into query, key, and value vectors and then perform their operations like so. However, in code, what we would do is we would kind of like perform all these operations in parallel, but within the same tensor itself. So they're not like three individual vectors, but they're all just three like stacked tensors. And so what's going to happen is that this is going to be like 512 cross whatever three times 512, which is 1,536, right? And then this is also going to be um, an, uh, just a feed forward layer of 512 x 512. And so when we pass, when we have like a forward pass where we're going to have batch size, cross sequence length, cross D model, this is the input. So in our case, it'll be, what is the batch size? This is going to be like 30 cross 200 cross 512. We then pass it through the query key and value layer, which is up here. And so we're going to get for every single one of these, we are going to get for every single word that we have, Instead of, we're gonna have three vectors of 512 dimensions each. And so that'll be 30 cross 200 cross, well, instead of three times 512, it'll be 1,536. Then we're gonna reshape it though, to be batch size, which is 30, sequence length. Now we want to break out this last dimension into these parts, because right now we have the query key and value vector, but we wanna break it up into eight heads. Number of heads is eight times the heading dimension over here is three. T it's going to be 64. So it's three times 64 for every query key and value vector, which is 192. So we've now broken up the query key and value into eight heads. And now I'm just going to switch up 
basically the dimensions over here. So it's 30 cross 8 cross 200 cross 192. And that's how it's going to look because we're switching these two dimensions here. Now, what this chunk will do here is it's going to basically break this entire tensor of this shape into three parts. And the way that it's going to break it up is in accordance to the last dimension. So we'll have now QKV vectors where let's just say each R 30 cross 8 cross 200. Let's just put a cross over here cross instead of 192 it'll be 192 divided by 3 which is 64 that's qkv each of them are this now let's actually take these values over here and if we pass it now into our scale dot product attention let's revisit this just to see how what 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 we're, what we're actually looking at so just to see this let's say qkv and they are going to be 30 cross 200 cross what did i say here that would be it would be 30 cross 8 cross 200 cross 64 so let's just copy and paste that right over here now what we're doing here is this last size we're going to say we're going to get the shape of q which will be returning this value and it will return the last part of that shape which is 64. so dk is 64. Now, when we scale this, this is going to basically take the square root of 64, which is 8. And we're going to perform a matrix multiplication of these two operations here. Now, when we perform a matrix multiplication, it's going to be of 30 cross 8 cross 200 cross 64. And then we're transposing just these two layers over here. So it'll be 64 cross 200. And so we are going to end up with a 30 cross 8, cross 200, cross 200 dimensional tensor. Now, this is the batch size, the number of heads, and now this is going to be our little precursor to our self-attention matrix because it's number of sequence, that's the max sequence length, cross the max sequence length. So this is the precursor to our self-attention matrix. Now, this mask here, I've said broadcasting to add because in PyTorch, you actually don't need the exact same dimensions that you're adding when you're adding tensors. So for example, this mask is actually going to just be probably a 200 cross 200. But because we're adding in this way, we are actually going to be, PyTorch is pretty smart in that it's going to just add this 200 cross 200 matrix to every batch and every head. And so it'll apply it everywhere in parallel that we need to. So essentially, we're going to end up eventually after this with the same matrix, even if we were to do, um, you know, some masking, we'll, we'll still end up with the same shape. Now, attention here, it's just applying a softmax operation. And like we saw before, if we kind of scroll to the self attention here, you see that this was the before shape. And then after you apply attention, you'll see that this is the after shape and nothing has changed. No shape has changed at least, except the values themselves have changed. So we'll come back here and it's essentially going to be just the same shape. Now the value is going to be a matrix multiplication of the attention matrix cross these, this value tensor. Now we know that this attention matrix is this shape and the value tensor is of this shape. So what we're gonna do is we have it for every single batch, for every single head. We are now also going to have, it's going to be attention that's 20, 200 cross 200. And then if we multiply that with 200 cross 64, we're going to get a 200 cross 64. So what this is is for every batch, for every head, for every word, we now have a 64 dimensional embedding. That is the value tensor. And we're going to return both of these two back. So let's now go back to the logic where, let me copy this over. So now we have an attention and value matrices. So we'll have 
attention is going to be this, and then the value is going to be, let's just copy this, which is essentially the same thing, but 64, just for our reference. Now we're going to reshape the value tensor to just be this dimension. So let's see if the math works out here. So that's batch size is 30. The sequence length, this should actually be the max sequence length over here, which is, um, this is going to be 200. And then the number of heads is going to be eight times the heading dimension, which is going to be 100 and which is going to be 64. So eight times 64, that's 512. And if we compare it to our old value tensor over here, that's 30 cross, well, what we're doing is we are essentially taking this 30, we're taking this 200, but we're multiplying eight times 64 to be 512. So a little bit of a rearrangement is going on, but essentially we now essentially have what we actually input to our, to our uh, function for multi-head attention. So whatever goes in, the shape also comes out. And so this entire out vector over here is just going to be kind of like this X, but just way better in terms of contextual awareness. And it's because that they have like the same kind of inputs and output shapes that we can cascade them one after the other as many times without worrying about like disrupting some code logic here. Now, multi-head attention is now going to return all the way to the encoder layer right here. So we're, we input, I should have said this too over here, where it's going to be 30 cross 200 cross 512. But essentially, even after self-attention, we're going to have the same 30 cross 200 cross 512. Now, dropout, nothing changes. It's just going to randomly turn off neurons. And when you randomly turn off neurons, it doesn't really affect the output. And then we're going to perform layer normalization. So let's actually get into layer normalization. As with any kind of module, layer normalization has a constructor as well as a forward pass for forward propagation. Now parameter shape will actually tell us along which dimensions we want to perform the layer normalization on. And typically this is going to be your embedding dimension. So in this case, it's going to be like 512. And that will be like the dimension itself. Now EPS is just a very small epsilon value because we're gonna perform some division over here. Like we have a standard deviation where we have this epsilon and this is gonna be a denominator. So in case that the standard deviation becomes zero at some point, it's to prevent these, these um, infinite uh, values that might occur because of division by zero. Gamma and beta. Now these are two learnable parameters that we are going to, as we, you know, as the network learns, it's going to be updated continuously. In this case, these are going to be, in this case, they're gonna be 512 dimensional tensors. Both of them are 512 dimensions that we'll just define over here. Now, this gamma is effectively going to represent like a standard deviation of values, whereas beta is going to represent the mean of values that we'll be applying, you know, that'll be, you know, learned continuously during, um, you know, as we get more and more examples into the network. So now when we take our forward pass, we'll provide some inputs. Now recall that the inputs have a shape of batch size cross max sequence length cross 512, which is D model. Now this dims over here is going to be just the length of parameter shape. In this case, it's going to be just like negative one, I believe, that we're just basically saying this is the last dimension along which we want to perform layer normalization. And that is true. We want to perform layer normalization on the layer dimension. So what we're gonna do is we're essentially just going to take the mean of all of the values. Let's say we have a word vector, right? Of 512 dimensions. We'll take the mean of all of those values and we'll get only one value, right? So that's exactly what we're doing in this step. 
And keep dimensions true would be that, well, instead of getting a 30 cross 200, we will get 30 cross 200 cross one, because we want to keep all three dimensions here. And that's why we set it to true. And now we compute the variance, which is basically taking every input value, subtracting the mean for that layer, and then we're going to take the overall mean, and that will be our variance here. And this here is also going to be another 300. It's going to be 30 cross 200 cross 1. And so our standard deviation is just going to be the square root of the variance, and which is also hence going to be just the same shape because we're just scaling it. Now what we're going to do is take the, every single input in that dimension, like 512 dimension, we'll subtract the mean of that 512 dimension and divide it by the standard deviation of that same dimension. And what this allows us to do is now come up with an output that is, again, 30 cross 200 cross 512. But every single one of these you know, word vectors is now going to be layer normalized. So it'll have values such that, you know, the mean is zero and variance is going to be one. And this is the same concept as like normalizing your, your data and hence the name layer normalization because we're normalizing data by the layer. Now, we, when we're applying layer normalization though, this is only applied to like a single sample or at most a batch of samples. But we want to make sure that these numbers are applicable for across the training set. And so that's kind of why we have learnable parameters, gamma and beta, that will kind of help us in making sure that we are scaling these values Y appropriately so that the, the eventual output tensor that we get is going to be comparable throughout every single example. And so when we apply, like, let's say self dot gamma, we, we basically multiplied with every single value of y, we are going to get the same 512 dimensional output. And I can put um, a multiplication with like, even though gamma is not the same shape, it's like 512, it's effectively going to say we have one value of gamma that is one learnable parameter for an entire batch um, and for like an entire sequence of of values. And so for this entire thing, because we have 512 dimensions, we are going to have 512 learnable parameters in gamma and another 512 learnable parameters in beta. So this concept here, because you know there are different shapes, it's the same as broadcasting that I mentioned way up here when discussing like how we're adding how we're able to add two different vectors of different dimensions. So I hope this makes sense. And now what, whatever was input, the same shape is output. And we now end up with a layer normalized output. So let's take this. And now what we're doing here is we would have added the residuals, which wouldn't have changed the shape. And we now perform layer normalization, which we know also just doesn't change the shape. And again, now we're taking a residual connection just to repeat. If we go to our case over here, you'll see that, let's see, go over to the figure. We're now at this stage over here where we're taking a residual connection. We'll pass it through a feed forward layer and then add and normalize. And that's kind of exactly what we're doing in this step over here. So we now pass it through a feed forward layer, which is essentially going to be these point wise feed forward. Now this point wise feed forward ticks in D model and also that hidden dimension of 2048. So let's actually go to this really quick over here. So we have a constructor, we have a forward method. Now this is going to be a linear layer, which is 512, 512 x 512. That's how it's going to transform it. And this is another linear layer, which is going to be or rather 512 cross 2048. And this is another layer, which is going to be 2048 cross 512. We're going to apply ReLU here. No, ReLU here is an activation function. And there are different kinds of activation functions. So activation functions in general, they help neural networks learn more complex patterns. 
So typically, when we say that there is no activation function that is, you know, without ReLU, what a function might have looked like a straight line that just basically passes through. And you know, with straight lines, you're not able to capture as much information. However, if you're able to do, you know, ReLU is, a, is an example of a piecewise linear function. So that means it's made up of multiple straight lines. And so it's better able to kind of capture information. And also it kind of in its own way also acts as a regularizer where it, where it will turn off certain neurons activation. Now, because this tends to lead to a problem in some implementations, you might see something called leaky ReLU that is adopted that allows some information to be passed through here. And we can also have used like the Tanch operation, which would have, you know, constrained the values between negative one and positive one. And then we have like the sigmoid activation, which we typically use when we're interpreting probability values on the out or like the last layer of your neural network. So depending on where your use case is, we would typically use these activation functions and a commonly used one is ReLU. And so I'm using it here. So we have ReLU and then dropout, which don't really change dimensions. And so we have our input, which is again, 30 cross 200 cross 512. We then now take it, pass it through the linear layer. This linear one is 2048. So it's going to now be expanded to 2048. Pass through ReLU, which means that it doesn't change its shape, but the values will change because it's activated. And then we perform dropout, nothing changes, and then linear two, which means it comes back to its original 512 dimensions. And so the input shape is the same as the output shape, and that is what we are returning back. And so that's our pointwise feed forward layer. And if we go back here, you'll see what comes in also comes out. So essentially this FFN, or feed forward network is just going to return the same dimensions. Dropout, like I mentioned, will not change anything. And also layer normalization, which we did previously, will not change anything. And so even here for this entire encoder layer, whatever is we input here is what we are outputting as well, at least in terms of shape. Now, because of all these operations though, like I mentioned before, this new output X is just going to be much more context aware than what was the input over here. And so the control will now return back to, well, self layers where we're going to execute this same exact process, the same forward pass like five times because we have five layers. And in each case, we're just going to not change the shape. The sh input shape is the output shape. So we can just keep recurring through them. And then once we finish the sequence, we will end up with the final vectors X that happen to be just really good at you know, just encapsulating context. And when I say really good at encapsulating context, this is only after some training has commenced as it just gets better and better as we look at examples. Now, all of the shapes that you see that I've mentioned here, I think I've covered all the shapes that can possibly happen here. All of them are actually written out in a flow right here when, you, when I execute it on dummy data here. So you can kind of see the flow controlling going from attention to dropout layer normalization, where we start out with the same tensor, 30 cross 200 cross 512. And even after like the sea of operations, you can see that we'll end up with an output of still 30 cross 200 cross 512. Yeah, so I hope that all of this kind of just makes sense. I'm gonna put the code for this notebook, which is the same as this code essentially, and I'm gonna put it all in the description down below. So it's gonna be all on GitHub, so please do check it out. And if you think I deserve it, please do give this video a like, do share, do subscribe, and we'll continue in the next video, our discussion for building out the decoder. I actually have some code for that and it looks pretty cool too. And we're gonna do kind of a similar deep dive, but also I'm also gonna do like an architecture deep dive where I go through something like I have been before, like here. So if you kind of like all these explanations, which are you know either textual to get intuition,
or you know they're very practical with code, please do consider subscribing. It'll really help me a lot. Do share, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.